right. Welcome, everyone, to today's session of Strategic Farming Let's Talk Crops. Uh, today's topic is going to be about what pays for soybean insect management. So uh, we have a couple uh, sources of support for these programs. These sessions are brought to you by University of Minnesota Extension, as well as support by the Minnesota Soybean Research Promotion Council and the Minnesota Corn Research and Promotion Council. I'm Anthony Hansen. I'm an Extension Educator in Integrated Pest Management based out of Morris. And today we're welcoming Dr. Bob Cook. He is a professor in the Department of Entomology at the University of Minnesota and our Extension Soybean Entomologist. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Cook and we'll get started on what's going on with our soybean insect management and basically what pays for our different management tactics that we have out there. Thanks, Anthony. Can you hear me okay? Yep, you're good. And am I displaying my slides correctly? Yep. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, yeah, so based on some of the questions that uh, people submitted while registering, um, what we're going to cover today is some aspects of soybean aphid management, specifically uh, insecticide resistance, what's the current status, and, uh, you know, um, some updates on some of the other insecticides. And then there were questions related to new pest issues in soybean and specifically soybean gall midge. So I'll provide some updates on research related to soybean gall midge and then another new pest. And I think we'll have time for questions. And uh, you know, through that, we can address any new questions that folks might have or some of the other questions that were submitted during the registration process. So to dive into things here, uh, if my slides work, we're going to start with soybean aphid, and I think this is a familiar pest for most folks, so I'm not really going to go over any of the uh, general biology for this insect, but what I want to do is get into insecticide-based management for this insect, as this is how we've been um, controlling this pest in our soybean crops for, you know, almost over two decades now. The first thing I want to talk about is one of our organophosphate insecticides, Chlorpyrifos. So this is an insecticide, um, you know, in products like um, Lorsban that are commonly used for soybean aphids, spider mites, other pests. And it's been a bit of a roller coaster ride over recent years in regards to this insecticide and regulatory status. So folks probably recall that back in 2022, EPA had revoked the tolerances and we could no longer use chlorpyrifos containing products on, on our crops. However, more recently, just last November, the Eighth Circuit Court um, vacated that order, kind of reversing it, calling EPA's decision uh, arbitrary and capricious. And that opened the door then for the Minnesota Department of Agriculture to now is in the middle of the process of conditionally registering products through the end of this year. So my understanding is that this depends on the registrants or companies submitting their paperwork to MDA to get um, things registered for the year for use on crops or other labeled uses. And I think um, an added condition on that is that MDA's uh, best management practices for chlorpyrifos need to be included um, with, with the product. And that information I, I got from a recent update from the Minnesota Soybean Grower Association. Shifting gears here to the pyrethroid insecticides, which are group three. This is another group of insecticides that have been heavily relied upon for soybean aphid management over the years. And that reliance or over-reliance has resulted in insecticide resistance developing. And I've talked about that quite a bit over the years. Um, so what I want to highlight here is um, touching on how bad is the problem in the field, right? A lot of the work that I've shared before has been these glass vial bioassays or laboratory molecular work, um, which is important for documenting and studying the resistance, but it doesn't really tell users how, how well or how poorly the products are actually working in the field. But we do have some data to, to address that specific question. So we dug back through literature from 2005 to 2020, 
from research studies performed by me and my predecessor, um, David Ragsdale in Rosemont, and then by Bruce Potter in southwestern Minnesota in Lamberton. These are our typical insecticide efficacy trials. And we compiled those data over multiple years for the pyrethroid insecticide uh, Lambda Psi Halothrin and calculated percent control. And then with this, we were looking at what we call practical resistance. And that's that decrease in efficacy of field applications of the insecticide. So for Rosemont in southeastern Minnesota, on this graph, we see um, time across the x-axis in years from 2005 out to 2020, and then percent control. So the larger numbers where we see the uh, percent control values for you know, 2005 to 2014, right up around 100% control. Uh, Lambda Cyhalothrin was working very well against soybean aphid during that period. However, after 2014, the percent control dropped very rapidly at about a 20% decrease per year. And then if we look over to southwestern Minnesota, we see a very similar pattern with that decrease happening at the same time after 2014, but that the rate of decrease was slightly less in, uh, in Lamberton than in Rosemont. So what this shows us is that field efficacy with Lambda-Cyhalothrin started breaking around the same time that a lot of our uh, laboratory studies started showing we have resistance and that the um, efficacy of this product or this chemical uh, deteriorated quite rapidly where you know I'm at the point where I would um, really shy away from recommending use of a pyrethroid on a first application against a soybean aphid infestation. So the other question that we had is, will this pyrethroid resistance go away? So if we're able to implement some insecticide resistance management, might we be able to get back the efficacy of some of these pyrethroid insecticides? Um, I'm just gonna, for sake of time, skip through some of that. So what, what we're looking at here is fitness costs. And a fitness cost is kind of a, a detrimental effect of an organism developing resistance to something, right? So on the benefit side for the, the insect in this case, they can survive exposure to the insecticide when that insecticide is in the field. But if they're in a field without insecticides, they're maybe reproducing more slowly or not surviving as well. So that's the kind of situation that we would like to see because then if we can reduce our insecticide inputs or pyrethroid inputs in particular, then the susceptible aphids could potentially increase in abundance, outnumber the resistant aphids, and we could regain um, efficacy of the, uh, or susceptibility in that aphid population. So this was a, a three-year study, and we're gonna focus on 2020. And the goal here is to look to see if we have these fitness costs in Minnesota soybean aphid populations. So we use these glass bio bioassays to measure the level of resistance in the aphid populations. Here you can see several of those populations from 2020 where we've got the concentration of lambda cyhalothrin on the bottom of the graph, survivorship on the side of the graph. So as the insecticide concentration increased, survival decreased. And just as, as an example of how much resistance we had in some of these populations. You can see our most susceptible population compared to the most resistant population. And that was almost a thousand fold difference there. So it took a, a thousand times more insecticide to cause the same level of mortality in that population. So if those aphid populations with that large of a difference in susceptibility to the insecticides, we did some detailed laboratory work where we put the aphids on these leaf discs, then monitored them very closely, their survival, their reproduction. And based on that, we could calculate a value called the intrinsic rate of increase, which measures how fast those populations are, are likely to, to build up or increase. And what we see here on this graph is that intrinsic rate of increase value, so bigger values indicate higher rates of population increase. And then across the bottom, we've got our different populations with the dark bars representing resistant populations, the light colored bars representing susceptible populations. And what we can see here is that the resistant populations are actually doing better 
than the susceptible population. So it's the opposite of a fitness cost. So not what we'd wanna see for a resistance management program. And then we also wanted to look at how do populations increase on a, on a plant level rather than this more artificial um, setting with individual aphids on these little discs and cups. We infested plants with five aphids and uh, monitor their population growth over nine days. And in these graphs, you can again see for these resistant populations and susceptible populations, after nine days, how large those aphid populations were. And we see that it, there were either no differences among the resistant and susceptible populations, or again, that the resistant populations were actually doing better. So this is uh, not good news in terms of resistance management for the pyrethroid insecticides for soybean aphid. Um, this evidence kind of suggests that, you know, even if we were to reduce our input of pyrethroids into the system, it's unlikely that the populations are going to revert back to being susceptible. So it's that much more reason, I think, that we need to do a good job um, uh, managing our use of the other available insecticides for soybean aphid control, you know, things like uh, chlorpyrifos or some of the newer insecticides, um, some of those newer insecticides being some of these group four products like sulfoxiflor, flupyridifrone, which are Transform and Savanto, got the group nine, uh, Aphidopyropin, which is Safina, and then there's the neonicotinoids in group four A, and a lot of those are uh, more commonly used in mixtures. Um, our research is showing that these newer insecticides and the mixtures with the neonicotinoids are still effective against soybean aphid and even so against uh, populations that have pyrethroid resistance. Some of these insecticides like aphidopyropin, um, sulfoxiflor, flupyridifrone have the added benefit of being more gentle against the natural enemy. So, or yeah, more gentle to the natural enemy, so less toxic to them. So you can apply these to the field, do a good job killing the aphids, but it's not going to kill off things like the lady beetles and other beneficials. So Bob, since you're on this slide, um, got a couple questions that have either come in or I've heard um, basically across this winter at meetings. Uh, maybe we'll just start with the pyrethroids. You know, some folks have been asking, you know, we were talking about a lot of resistance there, generally not recommending them, but they're also cheap. So if someone says, well, I'm going to try it anyways, it's uh, low cost. Um, what issues might they be running into with that? And we might talk about a little bit more later, but um, I know we talk about natural enemies and broad spectrum insecticides with that one a bit. Yeah, I mean, so for soybean aphid, I mean, if it, we, we, right now we don't have a way to tell in advance if a field has resist, resistant aphids or susceptible aphids. So if you have resistant aphids, the pyrethroids aren't going to do much against them, but they're going to do a good job killing off the predators and other natural enemies. And we've seen situations play out where applications like that have been made and you actually end up with more aphids in treated areas of the field than in untreated areas of the field um, because you're getting rid of those natural enemies that would suppress the aphid populations. And then in addition to that, um, you're putting more pressure on that aphid population to become even more resistant to, to the pyrethroids. Um, how about the group one? So we talk about chlorpyrifos being back. If people can find it, is that one just from a resistance management standpoint, um, kind of setting aside other issues, is that one people should try to use this year if they can, just to move away from the pyrethroids or other groups, take pressure off those? Or what's your current recommendation with the situation on chlorpyrifos and what people might have for options to take advantage of this year? Yeah, I think it's an effective tool. It's got, um, you know, some other concerns around it. It's a pretty toxic chemical, you know, a lot of human health issues as well. I don't know that I would necessarily recommend that everybody start using it all at the same time, right? But I think we can consider it as a tool in the toolbox and something we can be alternating in with these other insecticides. All right. And last question, you mentioned this a little bit. Um, you might talk about this later, but some of these newer chemistries like uh, pedopyrifen, uh, less harsh than natural enemies. Is there any work or knowledge on if there's a return on investment? Uh, basically, if, you know, they might cost a little more as a new chemistry, but they're saving on the natural enemies. 
any um, ideas how that might pencil out or any just rough thoughts if there isn't research on that yet? That, that's a really good question. I'm not aware of anyone that's, you know, actually quantified that in, you know, factoring in that impact of the natural enemies. I think it's, it gets a little tricky, right? Because those natural enemy populations are going to be variable. Sometimes they come in at the right time. It can do a really good job preventing the aphid outbreaks. Other times they can't keep up, you know, so it's, we certainly can get benefits from them, but it's, it's not that guaranteed protection. Um, some of these uh, newer products, I think, are at a higher price point, you know, than, especially than a, a generic pyrethroid. So that's got to factor into people's decision making as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, we'll let you keep moving along here, Bob. Yep. So I'm going to skip ahead to the uh, to the next pest, soybean gall midge. And this is one of the newer pests, and you can see a picture here of some of the larvae on a stem. And these are the adults are these tiny little flies, kind of distinguished by this dark and light alternating pattern on the legs and kind of this smoky mottled color on the wings. And again, the larvae are probably the most characteristic, easy stage to identify, where they occur under the outer layers of the stem tissue, bright orange. And while they're feeding in those stems, they cause these darkened lesions at the base of the plants. And that can eventually cause the plants to break off, to wilt, and to die. And our colleagues in Nebraska have documented some pretty significant levels of yield loss, you know, with 100% yield loss on edges and, uh, you know, 17 to 31% yield loss in the interior of fields. Fortunately, in Minnesota, you know, where we have infestations, most fields are are nowhere near this heavily infested, uh, but it's quite possible that things could continue to increase over time. So I think it's something we certainly need to be aware of. This map shows where soybean gall midge is known to occur as of uh, the end of last summer. And we can see in Minnesota, it's through much of uh, the southwestern part of the state up to uh, what's that, Stevens and Pope counties and as far east as Rice County. Just a real brief overview of some of the management tactics for soybean gall midge. Uh, chemical control. There's a lot of research going on in University of Nebraska, Iowa State, and Bruce Potter has been involved in some insecticide work with uh, soybean gall midge. And unfortunately, the effectiveness is generally low. So unlike some other pests like soybean aphid in the early days, insecticides are not going to be a silver bullet for managing this pest. So we're going to have to be thinking about um, more true integrated pest management and incorporating other tactics. There's some uh, really promising research results coming out of Nebraska for host plant resistance or uh, gall, or which would be uh, gall midge resistant soybean varieties. And through a lot of screening work going on, they've got several soybean lines or varieties that appear to have resistance. And the hope is that those uh, soybean lines could be fed into uh, different breeding programs to um, increase the availability of gall midge resistant soybean. For cultural control, there's been some interesting work out in Nebraska with hilling that appears to be effective. And what hilling is, you can see in this slide that I got from Justin McMeckin from Nebraska, where they uh, essentially pile up soil along the, the lower parts of the stem, and that prevents the insects from getting access to the stem or prevents their infestation. And in this picture, it's pretty telling. You can see areas that had hilling are have green, healthy plants and areas that were not healed, the plants are dead. And they've got some data to back that up with the number of larvae per plant. And there's a lot more detail on that in a recent paper that Justin and his team published uh, earlier this year. The unfortunate part is I think the logistics of implementing hilling, um, you know, special equipment is needed to be able to push that soil up on the base of the plants. You know, so I think it would be some time before, uh, before anything uh, efficient could be implemented, you know, to, to use this on a, on a broad scale. That's the question I had, Bob. Um, are they just using basic equipment they use for potato hilling there or are there that, other That's my understanding, yeah. Okay. And I think they have to go through the fields pretty slow. Um, but I think what this might show is that, you know, protecting 
the stems of the plants, you know, is really the lower part of the stems of the plants is important, you know, and with further research, maybe we could find some other um, more efficient ways to provide that protection. Uh, again, this, this is a new past. We're kind of starting from ground zero in our knowledge with the biology of it and the management of it. So, you know, it's kind of a stepwise process here. The other aspect of management is biological control. And that's where my lab's been much more involved. And especially in collaboration with Dr. Amelia Lindsay, uh, one of our newer professors here. And one aspect of uh, biological control is predators or predation. And we've done a lot of work to document um, these predatory ground beetles. These are little beetles that scurry around on the soil surface and they're kind of generalist predators eating kind of anything smaller than them. And they're really abundant in some of the soybean fields that we've been working in with, uh, with inf infestations of the soybean gall midge. And we've done some follow-up work where we've taken them into the lab and put some uh, gall midge larvae into dishes with them. And we find that they will indeed eat soybean gall midge larvae. But the question this left us with is, sure, they'll eat it under these artificial lab conditions, but what's happening out in our fields? Is the predator actually eating the pest in our soybean fields? So for this, we did some, what we call a gut content analysis, and we collected beetles from the field, preserved them, brought them back into the lab, and then dissected out their guts. And then we're able to use some molecular assays to determine if these beetles have soybean gall midge DNA in their stomachs. If they do, that indicates that they were feeding on the soybean gall midge in the field. And if they don't, then you know they, they likely were not eating it. So it's kind of you know like some CSI work that we've got going on in the soybean fields. And this is just a quick snapshot of some data uh, from 2021 and 2022, where we've got on the side of the graphs, the solid line being the mean number of soybean gall midge per plant, so the level of infestation. The dashed line is the percentage of beetles that were positive, or the percentage of the predators that were positive for soybean gall midge DNA. And we see, you know, almost up to in the first year, almost up to 10% of the beetles with the gall midge DNA. And in the second year, almost 20%. And that the pattern that we see for the percentage of beetles with the gall midge DNA or the percentage of beetles that are eating the gall midges uh, follows pretty closely the abundance of gall midge in the field. So that's um, some evidence that, that this is an abundant predator, at least in some fields, and that it is indeed feeding on soybean gall midge. And then the other aspect of biological control is parasitism. And this is from tiny little parasitic wasps that potentially inject their eggs into pests. And then the wasp larvae hatch inside the pest and uh, feed on the pest, eventually killing it. For soybean gall midge, we knew nothing about these uh, potential parasitoids. So it, it was an entirely new line of research. And we took two different approaches. We would bring soybean stems into the lab that were infested and rear them out to see if we would get any parasitoids coming out with the soybean gall midges. And then we did some similar molecular work, similar to what I explained before, where we take the soybean gall midge larvae from the stems and then use these molecular tools to see if they had wasp DNA inside of them. So if the gall midge has wasp DNA in it, it means that a wasp either injected an egg or that egg is hatched and the larva is developing in there. And through this work, we discovered a new species of wasp. So not only is the soybean gall midge a new species, not just new to Minnesota, but new to science. No one's, no, nobody, nobody knew of the soybean gall midge prior to you know, 2018, 2019, when it was officially identified. And then uh, this wasp, um, we just published, oh, there's a typo there. In 2023, we published a paper describing this new species of wasp that's associated with soybean gall midge. You can see how tiny it is uh, with a gall midge larva and one of these wasps on a penny with the, uh, the numbers of the year as a size reference. And from some of the work we were doing, we've been seeing about five to 10% parasitism rates or five to 10% of the gall midge population is being killed by these wasps. 
And we've been expanding our work in 2021. We are looking just in uh, Laverne, Minnesota on one farm. On the left, we've got our data from the emergence buckets. And then on the right, we've got those molecular assays and we detected this wasp, Synopius maximum, through both those methods. And then I had an additional student start and she found um, this wasp through the molecular methods, not only in Minnesota, but into South Dakota and Iowa in 2022. In 2023, we found it again in Minnesota, South Dakota, and Iowa. We're still working on processing some samples from Nebraska to see if we have it there through the molecular work, but we did detect it in Nebraska from the emergence buckets. So to date, we've detected this new species, Synopius maximum, from the four different states. And another exciting find is that some of these um, samples that were reared from Nebraska resulted in an additional species of wasp. It's different from Synopius maximum, the one that we uh, just recently documented last year. You can see this new one has a much longer, skinnier abdomen. There's some different structures on its uh, thorax here. And we're working with a taxonomist to see if this is something that's already known to science or if this is another new species. Um, I think with that, I'll leave this summary slide up, Anthony. And if you've got any questions about yeah. slate stall midge before we transition into the next pest. Yeah, sure. Um, one of the questions I think just posing, especially with the topic of this uh, overall session today is um, not necessarily what pays for insecticide in this case, but what can farmers do if they're worried about it or if they actually do find it? Let's say they're in Southwest Minnesota, it's knocking on their doorstep or we get an infestation show up more in the central part of the state that actually is more severe that we haven't really seen so far, it sounds like. Right. So it fortunately, throughout much of Minnesota, our infestations are, I I guess I could I can pretty comfortably say most infestations in Minnesota are not at the point where we need to be managing. But my concern is that things are going to continue to increase um, and, and that we will need to begin managing this pest. Um, I think to decide if something needs to be managed, I think some things to think about would be, you know, kind of the history of infestation. If you've got multiple years with uh, problematic large infestations, um, you know, and then some of these different options could be considered, but, but we really aren't seeing that in, in too much of Minnesota down in extreme Southwest Minnesota. There's a few fields that we've seen I think, um, again, it, it's going to be a tricky pest to manage. The insecticides are not proving very effective, I think, because there's a long period of adult emergence, and we would need multiple applications of the insecticides to suppress the adults. The larvae are protected in the stems. Um, so my hope is that by the time um, this thing becomes more problematic in Minnesota, that we'll have some resistant varieties available, maybe some... Uh, more efficient uh, cultural control tactics available, a better understanding of biological control and how to get more benefit from these natural enemies out there. So there's actually a question related to the genetics, Bob, uh, basically host plant resistance there. Uh, do you want to give a little more background on what we know about that so far in terms of how the plant's being protected or how well it's working? Um. So from the updates that I've seen from the folks in Nebraska, it looks like some of these soybean lines or varieties are showing a pretty high level of resistance where they're in fields where they've got their experimental plot set out. And, you know, some of these varieties or soybean lines are getting pretty ravaged, whereas some of these over multiple site years, multiple locations or multiple years are holding up pretty well and not showing much for a, uh, um, infestation. We still don't know how these plants, what, what kind of resistance these plants have. Is it um, like an anti-preference thing where the insects just decide not to lay their eggs on them? Or could it be that these uh, plants are producing some chemicals that uh, cause more mortality or less reproduction 
in this past, we still don't know that yet. That's where I think some of the, the follow-up research will need to go. And another question that came in was uh, use of insecticides from the planter itself. How effective would those be, if at all? <clears throat> yeah, my so it, my understanding is that a lot of the seed treatments haven't been very effective against soybean gall midge in, in some of the small plot research that's going on. I think, uh, I think uh, Aaron Hodson in Iowa might have some data showing that very high rates of some of the seed treatments have shown some efficacy. Um, and in Nebraska, some of Justin's work has recently shown that uh, one of the soil applied insecticides was providing some, uh, some decent levels of control, but I'm totally blanking on the chemical right now, but it's, uh, it's something that most folks aren't too interested in using. Um, yeah, I apologize for blanking on the name of that, but I'll try to look it up here when we got a, a little bit of time. And I'll have some wider questions on not just specific insects here in some of our insecticides too. Um, this one we could address with soybean gall midge, but also back to soybean aphid. I have a question on how the mild winter is affecting our insect populations. So what do you think about soybean gall midge? I know you've been doing a little work in your lab on cold tolerance of this one. Yeah, so just to step back and even kind of just some more general comments, right? So a winter like this without much snow, if it was a normal winter, it would it would um, lead me to believe that, you know, we could maybe experience higher levels of insect mortality because we wouldn't have that insulating blanket of snow on the ground to protect a lot of the insects. But this year, not only do we not have much snow, we haven't had much cold, right? So that lack of snow... I don't think is going to be too much of an issue here. Um, so overall, I suspect that we're going to have pretty good survival of a lot of the um, overwintering insects in Minnesota. For soybean gall midge, I've got a student doing some work looking at its uh, ability to survive cold temperatures. And some of our initial work was showing that this insect could survive pretty well um low temperature exposure and that the temperature that it could survive um or the temperatures that were required to cause it to freeze or to kill it were almost never experienced in the field when we looked at soil temperature data however we more recently did some work where we were holding the insects at these different low temperatures for longer periods of time and that works showing that, you know, as you increase the exposure of time that they're at these low temperatures, we start seeing more mortality and we start seeing a lot of mortality. So um, I think it's maybe a little bit of a glimmer of hope where maybe this pest is not as uh, resilient to the cold as we were initially thinking. But we need to do a lot of some additional work there, um, better characterizing how well they're surviving that exposure to cold at different lengths of time and then looking at soil temperature data to see how long our soils are at these different temperatures for different amounts of time. Yeah, I'll throw in the context. I work on the insect forecasting a little bit. Uh, soybean aphid, that one freezes, what about negative 29 Fahrenheit? They start to die off on average. So yeah, that's the context we're talking about when we're talking about this being a warm winter. For insects, they can tolerate quite a bit. Right. I don't have any other questions on soybean gall midge right now. Okay. So let's shift gears quick to um, an even more recent pest issue in soybean. And this is the uh, soybean tentiform leaf miner. You can see here, it's a tiny little caterpillar and it's so tiny that it lives within the soybean leaves. So it kind of hollows out the leaf and you can see here how small this insect is. This is one of the adult mons placed on a quarter for size reference. So it's about the size of George Washington's nose here. You get some good magnification. You can see the kind of striking color pattern of silver and orange and black. The immature stages, the caterpillars or larvae, um, hatch from eggs that are laid on the leaves. And then those caterpillars or larvae live within the leaves. They start out making these kind of linear or serpentine mines, hollowing out that leaf tissue. As they get bigger, they make that serpentine mine into what we call a blotch type mine. You can see one of the larvae 
inside that mine. And then eventually they create what we call a tentaform mine where the upper surface of the leaf buckles up. And you can see that there where it's kind of like a, a tented shape on the top of the mine, hence that name, the soybean tentaform leaf miner. And you can again see a larva inside there and they uh, form their pupa inside that leaf mine as well. Here's some leaves from one of the more heavily infested fields that I've visited. Um, you can see leaves that were ranging from, you know, several mines in those earlier stages to lots of mines in those more advanced stages. And what concerns me here is that all this tissue that has the mines eventually dies. So it's going to be non-photosynthetic. So overall, I think this insect is going to be reducing the amount of photosynthetic area of that soybean canopy. So kind of like a defoliating insect. Um, this is a native insect known to feed on two different native hosts. Uh, one of them being American hog peanut and the other one, a plant called slick seed fuzzy bean. And based on the literature and different databases, this is where we have historic reports of this insect occurring on those different native plants. And then if we look more specifically at where we have reports of it on soybean in the U.S., we've been doing some survey work going back to our first detections in 2021 to more coordinated surveys, you know, with help of Anthony and some other folks in Extension and the Minnesota Department of Agriculture and uh, North Dakota State, where we see um, an increasing area of known infestation in soybean. I don't think this is spread. I think this is just us looking for it more in soybean. Some of our heaviest infestations are down in the uh, Minnesota River Valley. In some of these areas, you know, outside of there, farther into western Minnesota, northwestern Minnesota, uh, in some of those fields, we had to work pretty hard to find it. So it's there, but not always at real high levels. For uh, in preparation, in case this thing does reach problematic levels, we're starting to evaluate insecticides. One of the first studies we did was spraying potted plants that had been infested at different timings so that when we went to spray, we had larvae either in those serpentine mines, blotch type mines, or the tentaform mines, which correspond with different stages of the larval development. And then we used agrimec insecticide and endigo insecticide in an untreated. And we put those potted plants into the greenhouse inside of cages and collected the number of adult uh, moths that came out of them. And we see here that if we sprayed when the caterpillars we're in that tentaform stage. We had almost no control with either of these insecticides, but if we sprayed those larvae or caterpillars when they were in the earlier stages, in those serpentine mines or the blotch mines, we got very good control with both of those insecticides, agrimec and endigo. So because that was a pretty kind of artificial setting, right, with the potted plants placed in the greenhouse, we wanted to start looking at levels of control in the field uh, so down in Henderson, Minnesota, this last summer, we set up a small plot efficacy trial with those two insecticides. We sprayed when the beans were at the R3 growth stage, and then came back uh, three weeks after infestation and quantified the percentage of the leaf area that was covered with leaf mines. And we'll see those results here with that percentage of the leaf area mined on the side of the graph, the three different insecticides, or two insecticides in the untreated across the bottom, and we see that endigo resulted in significantly less uh, leaf area injured than the untreated. But unfortunately, the overall level of uh, infestation in this field was fairly low. Um, I, we were optimistic that that infestation would continue to increase where we set this trial up, but it kind of flatlined. So we're going to try to repeat some of this work again this coming year. We're also doing some work to see if uh, any soybean varieties might be resistant to this leaf mining moth. So we did what we call a no choice study where we set up small cages with individual soybean plants. And then we had uh, several different uh, genotypes of soybean. A couple of them we considered susceptibles. Three of them had known resistance to different defoliating insects, different caterpillars or beetles. And two of them, had resistance to the soybean aphid with uh, the RAG genes. 
And we chose defoliator resistance and aphid resistant varieties to look at because these caterpillars change from a, a sap feeding form in their early stages to a tissue feeding form in the later stages. So again, this was a, this one was a choice, should have been, an, this was a choice test for this one. So we put all the varieties into a big cage, released adults, and then came back and checked how many eggs were on the plants. And we found that the susceptible plants had the most eggs and some of the uh, defoliator resistant varieties had fewer eggs. And this is some promising news that, you know, if this pest becomes problematic, you know, we've got some soybean germplasm that could potentially uh, provide some resistance to this pest. We also started wondering, you know, this thing has developed the ability to not only feed on these native plants, but also to feed on soybean, but are there any other legume crops that this pest might be able to feed on. So for this, we did another choice test where we put different types of legume crops that were potted into these cages, released adults. After uh, 48 hours, we counted the eggs. And we see here those different legume species across the bottom of the graph, eggs per plant on the side, high numbers of eggs on uh, just a typical grain type soybean and uh, edamame soybean, a vegetable soybean. And uh, no eggs at all were found on cow pea, kidney bean, chickpea, fava bean, and pea. And there were literally just a few eggs on lima bean and mung bean, whereas we had, you know, 200 to 250 eggs on the soybean. So this thing has the potential to lay eggs on lima bean and mung bean. But I think this was kind of an artificial scenario where the, the moths were probably stimulated by spending some time on the soybean. And then they just hopped over to these neighboring lima bean or mung bean plants and laid a few eggs. Because we did some other work where we had plants individually caged where they had no choice. They just had that one kind of plant to lay their eggs on or die. And in that experiment, they only laid their eggs on soybean, not on any of these other types of legume crops. Bob, I did have one question come in. Mm -hmm. um, any looking at alfalfa on the legume side or any of these other crops more in the kind of periphery that aren't directly as closely related to soybean? Yeah, so for this leaf miner, we haven't had a chance yet to look at alfalfa. Um, I'm kind of guessing that alfalfa will not be a host because these species of beans or legumes where we're finding egg laying are more closely related to the native hosts. So that one of the native hosts is American hog peanut and soybean is one of the most closely related species to American hog peanut. And then if we look at those other two legumes where we had a, a few eggs that were laid, the uh, lima bean or mung bean, those are much more closely related to soybean than are some of these other legume crops. And alfalfa, I think, is um, fairly distantly related to uh, to soybean or the native host. So I'm guessing it wouldn't be a host, but, but we don't have that data yet. So that was the content that I had, Anthony, just a quick summary here that people can see. And then, you know, if there's any other questions, if there's time. Yeah, this this question I have, and this kind of goes back to soybean gall mitch too. You mentioned that one was a uh, new one to science, just discovered. But as far as we know, it's not from another country, right? Well, we're, we're still not sure. So okay. it's soybean gall midge, it's new to science. There are no reports of it from anywhere else in the world. But that doesn't mean that it wasn't maybe occurring somewhere before and just had gone unnoticed and somehow got transported here. Um, so that's a possibility. It, uh, what I think is maybe more likely now that we're finding that soybean gall midge can feed on different legume species and kind of uh, widely or distantly related legume species. I suspect that soybean gall midge was probably a native, uh, maybe feeding on some native legumes like lead plant. Justin McMac McMacken's group uh, documented soybean gall midge on lead plant this last year, you know, so maybe it's always been out there at low levels. Nobody noticed it until it uh, started causing issues on soybean.
So this kind of going into my next question here was between soybean gall midge, now you have soybean tentiform leaf miner, both that, uh, you know, at least roughly appear to be native and have looked like they've just hopped hosts. Do yep. you have any idea of, you know, why this might be happening or why it's happening now? Uh, obviously, that's a tough question to answer, but right. yeah, it seems like there's a lot happening in just the last couple of years here. Yeah, that's a it's an interesting phenomenon. Um, you know, soybeans, a non-native crop came over from Asia, you know, so in the early years of soybean production, some native legume feeding insects hopped over right away and started feeding on it. Right. Like green clover worm, um, uh, some others like bean leaf beetle, um, you know, so it's not unheard of for these other, you know, native it's not unheard of for a native uh, legume feeder to switch over to start feeding on soybean. What what puzzles me is why it's taken so long for it to happen here or for it to happen and uh, increase to a noticeable level, right? It's, it's possible that these things could have been feeding on soybean for some time at lower levels and gone unnoticed, but it really seems like something's happened recently that's uh, certainly increased the severity of the situation. Yeah. So think about uh, tent from leaf miner. It sounds like you have a good case here where, um, you know, it's one, it sounds like you're not finding it in too high populations across the state. There's pockets. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to be doing widespread treatments for this. On the other end, you're showing that if you wait too long, um, basically you want to be out there scouting, catching it earlier, because if it's to that tent form stage, it's basically too late to treat already. So it's, it seems like this is one where you have a pretty good case for scouting and IPM here, at least. Yeah, I think I think we could certainly get there, Anthony. Again, it's it's really early with this past, and there's work that needs to be done yet to um, um, understand yield loss related to infestations from this insect. But this is one where you know seems like we know what stages we need to be treating um, the kinds of insecticides. Probably these uh, insecticides of translaminar activity that can move through the leaf tissue. Interestingly, even in the most heavily infested fields that we're finding, those infestations are seem to really be limited to edges of the fields with trees. So it seems like, you know, if this thing becomes problematic, this is a pass where maybe we could get by with some border treatments. Um, I, I think we've got some fields that are maybe pushing treatable levels if we think about this in terms of defoliation and you know some of the standard uh, defoliation thresholds that are out there um, you know we typically use in minnesota 30 percent defoliation prior to flowering 20 percent defoliation after flowering and we've seen edges of fields that are certainly above those levels so i think it's something people should uh should keep an eye out for and uh you know especially if you've got some other um, defoliating pests or damaging pests out there. It's something you might want to think about in addition to those. Sure. So I, we have about 10 minutes left and I have a lot of questions that have come in now. So I'm going to try okay. to rattle off a bunch of you and we'll get through as many as we can. All right. Um, waking up now, huh? Yeah. So one of the big ones, clover worm and soybean. Heard about this in Northwest Minnesota a lot. Uh, what's been going on there? Yeah, green clover worm, I think. Phyllis or Anthony, you guys might have a one of our crop news articles that you can share with folks. Yeah, there will be a document at the end. It'll have all the links for session up. Yep, Phyllis just posted in the chat for folks there. Yep, so that, that's a defoliating caterpillar that, that migrates in. Um, the caterpillars are fairly easy to identify. They're green colored. They got some lighter colored stripes. And they've got this interesting uh, behavior where if you kind of nudge them on the leaf, they're going to wriggle around and you know, oftentimes fall off the leaves. So that can help you distinguish them from others. They've got three abdominal pro legs. A lot of times, you know, I, I don't see fields that have infestation large enough with just this one particular species. But what, you know, can happen is getting green clover worms and other pests in fields and then kind of that cumulative or combined defoliation, you know, potentially getting up to treatable levels. So, um, I think from what I know, the uh, the labeled product should be pretty effective against it. I haven't heard of any um, performance issues in Minnesota or surrounding areas yet. Have you, Anthony? 
Um, I haven't heard anything specific on that one. Um, the other person, Angie Peltier, Northwest Minnesota, she's kind of been a point person on this lately too. So she'd be a good person for folks to get in contact with if you're yeah, in that neck of the woods. I think she's seen some infestations that have been mainly just green clover worm and, and pretty high levels, probably pushing nearly tr near treatable levels. Yeah. Um, how about yeah. drought conditions, Bob? We've been having drought for a few years, so... Is the recent drought going to help or hinder certain insect pests? I, I think it kind of depends on which pest, right? So like uh, classical arthropod pest that's benefited by drought conditions is spider mites. You know, so that's going to depend how this growing season plays out. If we get areas of the state that get really droughty, uh, spider mites are certainly something we're going to want to be scouting for. Um, I think... On the positive side is, um, you know, hopefully we'll we'll have some uh, more tools in the toolbox this year for managing spider mites with uh, this conditional registration of chlorpyrifos products by the MDA. Um, chlorpyrifos is one of the few products that works well against spider mites for the pyrethroids. The only uh, kinds of products we'd want to be using would be those with bifenthrin. And then I think uh, dimethylate can do an okay job. One of the other organophosphates. Um, and other than that, there's a, a couple other uh, more traditional miticides. Um, so during the growing season, if it gets dry, you know, that's something we'll certainly want to look for is spider mites. The situation where we've got parts of the state that have been very dry over multiple years, that can be conducive for grasshoppers. And I think especially you know, where populations have been building. And then now if we go into another spring and early summer and it's dry in some of these areas, um, I think we'll certainly want to be paying attention to grasshopper populations as those can continue to increase with dry conditions because those droughty conditions um, suppress some of the pathogens that help control grasshopper populations. So if you suppress the pathogens then the grasshoppers can do better, become more abundant. Yeah, and I think that's a topic been coming up more and more. People see the grasshoppers out there, but you don't always necessarily need to treat yet. So that's the question of does it pay or not for treatment? Um, we have those that threshold guidance for that reason out there because it's a very obvious pest, but is damage occurring enough yet? But we'll see this year, especially with ongoing drought, could right. be higher populations. Like there are said. some count count based thresholds for grasshoppers, or else the. Uh... You know, the defoliation based thresholds, which are, I think, especially more handy if you've got kind of a combined infestation of grasshoppers and other pests. Um, how about some of our pesticides? We had a question about residual control. So are there any of these that last longer? You get to, you know more protection on the plant afterwards, um, anything like that, or most of them short acting? Um, I think the... Uh, you know, maybe the pyrethroids are probably a little longer acting than the organophosphates. Um, you know, you'll hear some marketing reports of uh, some of these insecticides working for weeks and weeks of, you know, residual activity. I'd be really interested in seeing some of that data to see, you know, what some of those statements are based on. Um, you know, if you make a well-timed soybean aphid insecticide application with an effective product, you're going to knock down that infestation. And if you don't get any recolonization, sure, it's going to look really good. But if you start getting recolonization at different time points after that spray, you know, that, that, that would be the true test for that residual activity. And, you know, I don't know how well that's been quantified for a lot of the different products. Um, I got, I'm going to combine two questions here. First, Japanese beetle, how are we doing for you know, damage occurring in the state on soybean with that one? Have we got thresholds? Basically, what, what actually pays to uh, keep in track of for managing Japanese beetle right now, current conditions we have with that? And then also, how's bean leaf beetle doing in that same context? Yeah, so Japanese beetle is uh, another invasive insect that came over from Asia. Its populations have you know, it's been present in the Twin Cities area for a long time in the urban areas, but it seems like it's... Uh, abundance is increasing and spreading in Southeast Minnesota, especially. There's probably some other pockets of agricultural areas around 
um, some of the bigger cities in other parts of the state as well. This insect is a defoliator. It causes kind of a, the, the pattern of defoliation is kind of lace-like where it feeds on the areas in between the leaf veins, leaves the leaf veins, um, it really likes to feed on the top of the plants. For managing it, um, I would recommend using the, um, the defoliation thresholds that I mentioned before. So prior to flowering 30%, after flowering 20%. And for this insect, making sure you get a good estimate of defoliation throughout the canopy. So looking at leaves from the top, middle, and bottom of the canopy and averaging those together to get that defoliation estimate. Um, if you walk into a field that has a decent infestation of Japanese beetles, it's going to look horrible because all that defoliation is concentrated on those upper leaves. But you got to remember that you've got leaves below that that can kind of pick up the slack for those injured leaves at the top, right? So if you've got a decent canopy of soybean, you're going to have multiple layers of leaves that can help to intercept that light that's maybe passing through those upper leaves. So don't just look at the upper leaves and freak out, you know, step back and uh, take a look at the whole canopy and multiple locations within the field. You know, a lot of times those infestations are aggregated on the edges of the fields as well. All right, uh, bean leaf beetle, really quick. Um, I'm gonna ask maybe one big question after this one. <laughs> yeah, bean leaf beetle, I honestly haven't seen too much of it um, in my time here, you know, so over 10 years now, but, but there are increasing reports of it especially in uh, Western Minnesota. And I think uh, Adam Barn, Forest and folks in South Dakota are seeing more of it. So it's uh, kind of increasing on my uh, concern list as, as we're hearing more and more about it. Um, you know, so that can be a problem, you know, early stages of soybean, but fortunately a lot of the seed treatments provide some protection against it, but later generations can be problematic. Um, causing defoliation later in the year and uh, even feeding on the pods and developing seeds. Sure. So let's go back to, we, we can focus on soybean aphid with this one, but it can be for across the board for a soybean insect pest. But uh, the constant return on investment and in what we do for management, so let's say for tactics like seed treatments versus scouting, how does that balance out? Like how Basically, how effective are seed treatments? And do you have a okay chance of any return on investment there? And how's that compare to especially scouting and um, following the 258th and threshold? Yeah, th this is a, a pest situation, Anthony, where there's actually been some of that economic work done. You know, I think it's, uh, the pest has been around long enough um, across broad enough area. And uh, prior to when I started in this position or maybe in the early years when I was here, there was this group of researchers across the region that did a study comparing um, some of the prophylactic kind of preventative management tactics versus scouting and threshold-based applications for management of soybean aphid. And it, it really stood out that scouting and the threshold-based applications uh, provided a much larger return on investment for soybean aphid. You know, I think some of that is due to the fact that, you know, with seed treatments, a lot of times the uh, concentration of insecticide in the plants has decreased to levels where they're not very effective by the time aphid infestations are occurring. occurring. There are some fields though that might be getting infested early enough with soybean aphid, or maybe the soybeans are planted late enough, maybe in a situation where you have soybean after peas, where you can get enough overlap of the high levels of concentration in the plant and aphid colonization to get a return on investment there. You know, some of the other kind of preventative prophylactic or insurance applications of foliar insecticides, um, you know, they might do a good job killing whatever aphids are there, but, you know, we don't know if that infestation eventually would have reached a damaging level um, or, you know, we could get recolonization later in the year after that. And quick follow-up for the last thing, how about folks that, you know, they might be saying, oh, you should spray it 50 aphids per plant instead. Um, that concept of, we talk about 250 threshold, but what does that really mean for plant damage and when yield loss is actually occurring? Yeah, so the, the, the 250 aphid per plant threshold, it's based on multiple years of research across multiple states and research continues 
to support its use. So that 250 aphids per plant is not an infestation level that's causing yield loss. That's an infestation level that should trigger you to start lining up that insecticide application so that you can knock that population down before it gets to damaging levels. All right, with that, I think we're gonna wrap things up here. So thanks again, Bob, for uh, presenting here. And thank you everyone for attending today's uh, Strategic Farming Let's Talk Crops program.